Recovering from Narcissistic Abuse by Deciding How You're Spoken To. I want to talk about a destructive tactic used by a narcissistically abusive parent and how you can begin to heal from it and live in defiance of it. And let me start with a fictionalized example of a client named Terrence. So Terrence grew up with a narcissistic mother who would yell and berate him for the slightest supposed offenses all throughout his childhood. She divorced his father when he was 11 and could not seem to hold on to relationships nor friendships. In contrast, Terrence was a genuine and very likable kid who had no trouble making friends in school and in sports. However, Terence's natural buoyancy and vitality slowly and slowly eroded as he grew up under his mother's sort of tyrannical reign. It seemed to him that she would grow angry and intent on hurting him just by his showing up in her line of sight. In therapy um, for Terence, he described knowing it was a matter of when, not if, she found something he had done wrong around the house and erupt into a screaming tirade at him. And his protest of innocence, or that her reaction was maybe disproportionate to his mistake, only seemed to make her more furious with him. I mean, in her mind, how could he deny the evilness of his actions? Well, suffice it to say that there was no speaking reason to his mother to get her to speak to him more civilly. Instead, Terence had to become hypervigilant and self-conscious to try to avoid doing or not doing the things that would set his mother off at him. Well, unfortunately, this never worked. It was like she was determined to find fault in him so that she could then feel permitted to unleash her hostile aggression at him as though he or she were the righteous one and he was the malevolent offender against her. Well, if Terence's story sounds familiar to you, then first of all, I'm sorry, I, I wish it didn't. But secondly, I want to talk in today's video about how you can heal from this form of abuse by challenging current claims that your supposed misdeeds justify someone else's abusive behavior towards you. That you now have mobility in the kind of company you keep, whereas before in Terrence's position you may not have. Furthermore, you can decide that the way you are spoken to gets to count as a criterion for whom you want to keep in your life and whom you want to move away from. And I think doing so changes the logic from whether you have done something to make someone else mad at you and therefore licensed to berate or belittle you to whether the person is speaking to you in an acceptable manner to you regardless of what you have or haven't done. And I'll explain more about that shift. Well, my name is Jay Reed, and I'm a licensed psychotherapist in San Francisco, California. And I specialize in helping people recover from narcissistic abuse from a parent or a partner. I think narcissistic abuse, especially when it's chronic and over a long time and during development, can leave us feeling estranged from, from our sense of who we sort of authentically are in the world. And in individual therapy and also through my online course on recovery from narcissistic abuse, I try to offer in essence a map that allows survivors to come back to the quality of life they know they deserve. And, you know, of course, that's going to look different for each survivor, but having a general sense of the features of this sort of terrain of recovery, I think, can be tremendously important and helpful. And there are three main features uh, to this map that I just want to kind of call out. The first, I call them the three pillars to recovery. The first pillar is making sense of what happened so that you know it was not your fault. The second, pillar number two, is gaining distance from the narcissistic abuser. And I mean um, psychological, emotional, perhaps physical distance. The third pillar is living in defiance of the narcissist rules. And, and finally, you can't do this in a vacuum. I think it's really important to find and participate in communities and new relationships of people who readily offer you validation and support along the way here. Um, today's video falls under pillar number three, living in defiance of the narcissist rules, and also pillar number two, gaining distance from the narcissistic abuser. And I've organized all the videos on this channel into three playlists that correspond to these uh, three pillars. So 
Finally, if you were a scapegoat survivor of a narcissistic parent or partner, then I also encourage you to check out my free ebook on this topic. It's called Surviving Narcissistic Abuse as the Scapegoat. And it goes into, I think, great depth about the um, experience of the scapegoat child to a narcissistic parent, you know, whether it's from the kinds of self-limiting beliefs you may have had to adopt in order to survive and keep that very strained relationship intact, um, or sort of what the psychodynamics are of a narcissistic individual and why it's, in essence, inevitable that they hurt the people close to them, partic particularly if they are pathologically narcissistic um, and not in treatment themselves, which unfortunately tends to be the norm uh, for folks with this type of diagnosis. Uh, this ebook, I in t my intention and hope is that it can help you realize how none of this abuse was your fault, but rather a product of the narcissist's own psychopathology. And you can find the link to the ebook uh, in the description box below or by clicking here. Okay, if you have been on the receiving end of a narcissistic parent's abusive language, abusive emotionality, and or physical attack, then you may have had to live by, in essence, a misbegotten set of rules. You know, like a, a set of rules that's fallacious, that, that, that are imposed upon, but don't sort of make much sense. The rules I'm talking about start with an asymmetrical relationship uh, where you may have found yourself more dependent on the narcissistic parent than, of course, they were on you. And that's just the nature of a relationship between a parent and a child. Well, this starting point ensures that your main objective has to be to keep the relationship going, that walking away is just not an option because you need the other person too much in, in, to be able to do without them. Next, the narcissistic parent will use you, the scapegoat child, in ways that allow them to offload their own feelings of worthlessness and coercively influence you to adopt those feelings as though they were your own. And here's an important way in which a narcissistic parent may often do this. It's called offending from the victim position. That is, they will blame you for committing a supposed unpardonable, unpardonable offense from being like so thoughtless as to not take out the trash like they asked you to. Uh, and I'm quoting things because I want to emphasize this is, these are often the words that come out of the narcissistic parent's mouth, not um, sort of a statement of fact. Um, or uh, responding to the parent in a, in a tone of voice that they claim is like disrespectful. Uh, one, again, a fictionalized client recalled that um, when their parent came home from work, and that called out their name uh, if, the, if the now client said something like what and wasn't intentionally inflecting a very sort of sweet tone that the parent would claim, you know, huge offense and use that as an excuse to launch into a yelling tirade uh, at this individual. All these kind of trumped up charges allow the narcissistic parent to feel licensed to treat the scapegoat child in I think very often horrific ways. The narcissistic parent will claim that your bad behavior justifies their bad behavior, perhaps saying or implying something like, you know, I wish you weren't so bad so I didn't have to yell at you or hurt you like this. So the scapegoat child's only option in this kind of situation is to work extremely hard to avoid the initial, again, trumped up offense so that the narcissistic parent cannot use these, again, offenses to excuse that parent's abusive behavior. Well, it's an adaptive move that lets the child survive an otherwise hopeless situation, but leaves the child in a state of constantly worrying about the other person's or narcissistic parent's happiness and expecting extreme disrespect, humiliation, and worse, if that parent decides the child has failed to make them happy enough. Um, in this way, the child has to sort of presume their guilt uh, and be proven innocent in almost every exchange with a narcissistic parent. The child is being uh, charged with an impossible task. Keep the narcissistic parent's very fragile yet inflated sense of self-worth afloat. Um, so it's inevitable they're going to be found to have committed the offense, again, of not succeeding in this task. And then that will, in this warped way by the narcissistic parent, be used to excuse their very malevolent uh, behavior towards the child. So the move the scapegoat child has to make in these situations from, say, protesting how the narcissistic parent is speaking to them 
to preventing the parent from having a reason to abuse them is a necessary but costly one for the child. Nobody would make this sort of move if they enjoyed an equal amount of power with the other person. It's only, this move is only made when one does not have the same level of power in the relationship as the other and has to keep that other person's favor towards them sort of at all costs, which is really the situation uh, of a parent, I'm sorry, of a child uh, who, who has a relationship to a narcissistic parent. In this situation, the child's own rights become a luxury that they just can't afford. If the child were to prize their right to feel respect from the narcissistic parent over their need to just have a parent there who seems willing to take care of them, then they could perish. The child could perish. Whether, you know, psychologically, if the child's very young, it could even mean physically. If they, you know, act in ways that don't placate the parent, um, the parent might sort of just turn away from them, neglect them so much or attack them so much that the child's life could be at stake in very severe cases. But whether that's the actual case or not, it can very much feel that way to the young child. And I think that's what's really important here. So, so much of recovery from narcissistic abuse, I think, boils down to incrementally learning and eventually then knowing that you can now do what once would have spelled your doom. In the case of the move to prevent the narcissistic parent from having reasons to get angry at you, the task in recovery is to accrue experience now that tells you it's survivable, again, now, to put your rights first in relationships. That your rights get to count more than the continuation of the, of the relationship. And as that principle gets ad adopted and practiced and learn that it's now safe to live this way, it also lets you select relationships where putting your rights first doesn't threaten the sanctity of the relationship. So what might this look like? Well, first I recommend being in therapy just to understand how you specifically may have had to adapt to your narcissistic parent's mistreatment and have the firsthand experience of feeling understood, validated, and supported in your own efforts to recover. And if you're a therapist and are interested in, a, in an effective way to work with survivors of narcissistic abuse, then I highly recommend my um, free six-part YouTube video playlist that walks you through how to apply a form of therapy called Control Mastery Theory. And you can find the link in the description box below or by clicking here. Well, next, if you're a survivor, you might practice the thought experiment of kind of rehearsing the fact or scenario that nothing you do or don't do today warrants anyone to mistreat you. You know, you may make a mistake, you may not say the right thing, but none of that has to license anyone to treat you with disrespect, uh, malintent, um, or a threat. And if someone does mistreat you for any reason, then you now have the right and the ability to remove yourself from the situation. And when or if you exercise your right to be treated only in the ways you find acceptable, then it may be particularly important to report these moments to the people you do trust in your life. Because, you know, whether it's a therapist or really vetted safe other people, you know, doing so can reinforce to you that you're now allowed and supported in your efforts to protect yourself without exceptions. That, you know, by rehearsing and practicing your right to be spoken to in the manner that you see fit, you can break the bind that used to tell you that one sort of, again, wrong move in the eyes of a narcissistic parent could mean that you're now have to face shame and devaluation. That that doesn't have to happen again and you get to be in charge of ensuring that in your life today. Well again, with all these tactics, I highly encourage you to exercise compassion and patience with yourself and even uh, maybe carefulness that if you're currently in a narcissistically abusive relationship, uh, you know, it is an incremental process to get to the point where it gets to feel safe enough to make the shift from avoiding giving narcissists reasons to get angry with you to deciding, hey, how do I want to be spoken to? And is this person speaking to me in a way I find acceptable? Um, again, that can take time. And I don't mean to imply today that it's the place to be for everybody. Um, wherever you are on your path to recovery, I think is exactly where you need to be. And with time, encouragement from safe, safe others, and your own support and compassion, then you are essentially on the right path. 
Well, thanks for watching this week's video. Um, and again, I just, you know, again, can't thank everyone enough for your continued engagement with the channel uh, in the comments, um, sharing some of your own uh, experience in recovery from this form of abuse and with each other and the, su the support that is almost like uh, seems to be universally granted to each other. Um, you know, sometimes when there's replies uh, to comments, um, it's just, again, I have said it many times and I will continue to, uh, incredibly heartening to see this. And um, it really means a lot that, that some of these videos has served as a jumping off point to um, forge some of that sense of community and that uh, some of the points made in this have helped um, in your own uh, journeys in recovery. Well, again, thank you, and I look forward to posting again next Friday, uh, usually around 9 a.m. Pacific time. Take care.